Uh, we've been, last week we were discussing, and this is kind of like the gap and beyond, uh, just because it kind of opens up so many different things to look into, and I'm having a hard time stopping, to be honest with you. Um, we won't finish today, and we may finish next week. Um, but the, it's about them angels and the fact that, I mean, the gap is, the reason the gap makes so much sense is because there was a fall. There was a rebellion. There was a, a catastrophe. And we see the aftermath of that and the attacks that the angels perpetrate on, uh, on this planet, on mankind. And there's a reason why they're doing it. They, they lost their, their king and their kingdom and their throne. And either they just don't want us to have it, which would kind of make God a failure for the second time, or they want to um, see if they can get it back somehow by default. Now, the reason you know that this is a possibility is because when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is here on this earth, he is uh, tempted of the devil. And one of the temptations was that the devil said, if you'll fall down and worship me, uh, you can have all these kingdoms. Well, you couldn't offer something unless you had it, especially if you're talking to Jesus Christ. How could you? You couldn't offer it unless you owned it, unless it was yours to give. And at that time, uh, the devil, the nations of this world, they were his to give. And, um, of course, the Lord put him in his place, and we're actually going to talk about that a little bit. But we, so we're talking about these angels and their attacks, and we saw that the first one obviously was in the garden, and we discussed it. And it's interesting that the uh, devil appear, appears as an angel of light. Um, I guess it would have been less threatening than, he, than uh, him looking like a serpent or a, or a dragon or whatever he looked like. So he appeared as an angel of light. Ab and Eve probably didn't think too much about that. They had probably seen plenty of the sons of God at the time. The angels descending and ascending, you know, and that, would, that could have been common. Uh, they were there to minister unto them that shall be heirs of salvation, of which, you know, Adam and Eve were going to be. So I imagine they were ministering. Then we, we looked at Genesis chapter 6, where they tried to contaminate uh, the, uh, the seed of mankind by intermingling with uh, the women of this world of the uh, uh, and took unto them wives, the, the Bible says. And there were, as a result of that union, there were giants in the earth in those days. But it says, he said there, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Um, God had to literally drown that thing out, and he had only one family that was pure in their generations with three boys, in which to start over with and repopulating the earth. That was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, we found out that we can't exclude the animals either because they were doing stuff with them. And, you know, I don't think this is just a bunch of lust. I think it could involve some lust. Um, but I think, it, I think it's a planned attack because they nearly got every family. And if they would have been able to contaminate every family, then God's intentions of what he had for mankind would have been ruined. And he let it get down to the, to the last family. Uh, then we saw about the instituting of the law. In uh, Galatians 3, it talks about, Wherefore then serveth the law was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it says, And it was ordained by angels, chosen by angels. And we found out in the book of Hebrews, when we read through that, uh, through Hebrews 1 and 2, we found out that God, um, um, whenever those angels sinned, whenever they Whenever they uh, erred from the way, he was, he was quick to judge them. And they used that on us. Said, if it was good for us, why isn't it good for man? And next thing you know, the law is instituted. And the Bible says it's a curse. Why would God do that? Because he, he, is, he is being pressured and actually forced. And we're going to look at the last one we look at. That one's going to kind of surprise some of you. Some of you may know it. Um, of the circumstance that God got himself into. And uh, now don't, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't worried about it, and I'm not going to worry about it. The circumstance he got himself into, he knew he was going to get himself out of. But um, then we saw the reappearance of the giants uh, that showed up in, the, 
in, in Palestine or uh, in Israel, and they were there to physically keep that Jew from taking the land that God had gave them. You know, one thing, they're just stopping the progress of a kingdom. So, I don't know if I got that. You know, I've got those two backwards. I should have had the, uh, the reappearance of the giants to physically keep Israel out of the land first and then the instituting of the law. Sorry about that. Then we have the appearance of Judas Iscariot. Uh, he is, and this is the last one we talked about, and of course he is called the angel of the bottomless pit. And uh, he is the king over the bottomless pit. And that's where he is now, Judas is now, and he's coming back later. But he was there to trip up the Son of God, or try, or to somehow stop him from bringing in a kingdom. He didn't do a bad job of it, but the Lord kind of knew that too. You know, it's like, you know, when the Lord knows, uh, when he's, you know, when he's 20 moves ahead of you, what are you going to do? But evidently, they, uh, the devil thinks this is, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, worth fighting and uh, worth trying to stop him. He knows, he knows he can't really do too much to the Lord, but man, he can mess with us all day long and twice on Sunday and get a lot accomplished, actually. Um, and that's what he tried to do. Uh, he he, uh, uh, he betrayed him, Judas betrayed him, and thought had the upper hand there, and then he realized that's what did him in. So that's what I mean by the Lord being ahead of him. And now let's talk about the next one, and that's in this age. And, um, you know, I don't know if we've ever entertained angels unawares or not. It's a possibility. I won't, I won't say it can't happen. Um, I don't know if we've... Um, I hadn't seen any giants walking around, so I don't know if any fallen angels uh, are, if they're even permitted or allowed to fall in this age. I don't know. Maybe you know of some. You know, maybe you know of some giants and basketball players, huh? NBA. NBA. There's a few of them there that are seven feet something, but I don't think any of them hit eight or nine, do they? And I think Og and King of Bashan and I think uh, Goliath were both like nine feet, something like that, nine and a half feet. Uh, that's big, man. Fair fine. You can, can you imagine that'll ruin basketball, won't it? Man, them giants are born again. That's it. Basketball's over with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how how high is the hoop? Ten. Ten feet. Yep. Would be that simple. But as far as but as far as us, we have this relentless. I don't know. I, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling the attacks. I, maybe it's because I'm discussing it. Um, but I, 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 feel the, uh, I feel like I'm wrestling with uh, spiritual forces right now. And Ephesians 6.12 says, and we've, we've read, uh, quoted this one over and over again, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's hard to believe that sometimes until you realize that, man, we've got some enemies out there that are far greater than flesh and blood. And they're enemies in high places. And I'm not talking about uh, Biden's government. <laughs> Uh, they're flesh and blood. But there's somebody manipulating that flesh and blood and coercing that flesh and blood to do what they want. And that's going to be a spiritual forces. Um, he says, uh, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're fighting against. And we always got to keep that in mind that, you know, it's, it, you know, I know we have differences with people, and, but the Bible says that um, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So we're looking at a world that's blinded, and it's being blinded by a spiritual force. Uh, we probably have a lot more people saved if the devil wasn't trying to stop us. I mean, if we didn't have all these, whatever his hordes are, you know, devils and uh, whatever they happen to be, if we didn't have that against us, we'd probably get a lot more people saved. And you'll find that out when you try to lead somebody to the Lord, uh, the interruptions of the, the things that happen, you, just, you can't even account for it. How in the world do these things happen to interrupt something that is so important and it happens so often? It's because there's spiritual wickedness in high places that we're wrestling against. We're fighting against them. 
Ephesians 2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He's up here in the air, man. And I'm afraid his spirits are up in the air with him. Uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, let me show you something. Ephesians 4, 14. One day I was reading this and it fin I finally caught on. <laughs> Lord doesn't even use expressions without some deeper meaning to it. He says that we henceforth, Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, the prince of the power of the air. And if you'll, Scripture with Scripture, you know that passage where uh, he talks about a woman or, or uh, somebody being possessed and it says that spirit was uh, left him and he swept and garnished the house, okay, cleaned up, cleaned up his act. He turned over a new leaf, but he didn't fill the void. And seven worse than him came back. But it says, it says when he left, he'd go through dry places. They don't like to be just out in the wind. They want to be in a body of something. That's why they either want to go into the swine, which they ran into the deep, because they went into the body of a swine, into a body of water. Uh, there are some of them that are in a body of water above our heads, very, very, very far above our heads. Um, and we'll talk about that eventually, too. But they're, notice about, not being carried about by every wind of doctrine. And these people, do, I mean, these things are just kind of floating around, and when it finds a receptive vessel, whew, next thing you know, you've got something that is coercing you. It's, um, and I'm not going to talk about demon oppression and possession, We'll look at that, Dr. Robert. Demons and the Christian, that's what we're going to look at. Because I feel like I've got at least ten of them right now. Um, more, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten more wicked than the one I had last week. Um, but I think, I think it's obvious. When you start seeing the spirit of this age and how it moves and everything, it is just amazing to me. Okay, I'll give you a good example. I remember when I remember when tattoos. If you had a tattoo, you were scum. I mean, you just were. I, I grew up like that. You know, somebody had a tattoo and they exposed that tattoo. It's like, oh, they're scum. You know, I mean, it's got a tattoo. Now it's the spirit of this age. Grandma was going down there to get a tattoo on her ankle. Okay. Huh? Or somewhere worse. <laughs> yeah. So you have everybody getting tattooed, you know. And uh, I had a friend in school. Me and him used to take karate together, and he became. Uh, he became a tattoo artist. He offered me one for free. I didn't take him up on it. Um, not interested. In, and, and, you know, we used to play around with the ink and the needles back in the day, you know, and I still didn't. There's, there's not a mark on me as far as I know. And I don't want a mark on me. I know what the Bible says about marking yourself back there in the Old Testament. And I'm afraid God will take a Brillo pad to me if I... Now, if you're lost and you took, you've got tattoos, there's nothing you can do about that. They're just there, okay? But... Save people? Man, I don't know. You're not reading your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible. You say, well, I can do it and I'll go to hell. Yeah, you can do it. You can smoke crack and die, too. I mean, you know, that doesn't mean you should. I don't want, you know, I just seem not have identifying marks, you know. And I love how these criminals, I think all criminals should get tattooed. I think we should sponsor it and pay for it. Because it's easier to catch them, <laughs> you know. Once they, especially when they tattoo their face, love that. And it's happening more and more. I, I mean, it's frightening to see somebody with tattoos on their face. I'm looking. I'm like, what are you thinking? So, but I usually see them in jail. So that's a good sign. Anyway, let me move on here before I get the prince of the power of the air. Uh, so they're spiritual, we're, we're in a spiritual warfare, and we can't see this, this enemy, but they're there. And they are influencing everyone and everything around you. And that's what you need to realize. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, well, Lord, you know, the uh, Bible says, talks about uh, standing and withstanding and having done all to stand. And that's what it is. It's withstanding, standing, and then having done all you can. And sometimes you lose a little ground, sometimes you gain a little ground. Sometimes they'll, you'll think you've got one you're getting ready to pluck out of the fire, and they'll, they'll pluck it right out of your hand. Happens. But we're in a warfare. 
Now, the next one is, of course, Daniel's 70th week. When I talk about that 70th week, it's that last seven years before the kingdom is prophesied to come. Uh, some of us know it as the tribulation period. I have no problem calling it that. The last three and a half years is, of course, the great tribulation. So, um, so that last week remains. And notice in Matthew, turn to Matthew 24, look at verse 36. You know, they tried once, and now they're going to try again. Genesis 6, they came down. Guess what? They're coming back. He says in verse uh, 36, make that 37, he says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So you go back, read about Noah. Well, what brought about Noah's flood? Well, these giants showed up. Genesis 6, 1-4. So as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be, for as in the days that were before the flood, they. Well, if you go back and read Genesis 6, the they is the angels. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them, how many? All away. Now, you could say they was, well, it was all of them because they were all, uh, they were all related. <laughs> I mean, the angels related to the men, men related to the angels, because at that point, all the generations had been contaminated. So the they includes all of them. It says, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look, turn to Luke 17. And we have the same thing here. Luke 17, look at verse 26. As it was in the days of Noah, or, or Noe, as it from Hebrew to English, so shall it also, uh, so shall it be also, I'm sorry, Greek to English, so shall it also be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them. How many? And yet they show up again. After Noah, they show up again in the land of Palestine, but he says he destroyed them all right there. Somehow, that genetic code to produce those giants was carried forward by somebody. Now, Ham's three boys, or I'm sorry, Noah's three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which is where the seed comes from, the man, they're pure. It says he's pure in his generations, so it has to be somebody else. And that's why they think it's Ham's wife and that she's a descendant of Cain. Now, it still would have been men, okay? But evidently, there could be giants born uh, uh, because of that genetic code or something or other. I don't know. That's a thought. I can't prove that. People probably think I'm crazy. I wanted. It, isn't it interesting? A Jew seeker for a sign to confirm a message, but when a Gentile sees it... <laughs> He's down there bowing his head. Why? It's because the, the Gentile doesn't seek for a sign. He seeks for wisdom. If he sees a sign, you know, I mean, if he sees Mary on a piece of toast, it's, hey, I'm bowing down to that toast, man. You know, that, that grilled cheese sandwich. It's got some power to it. Why? I see Mary's face in it. That's Gentiles. Jews, they need to see that, that power of God to confirm the message that's being preached. And that's how, why you have signs and wonders. You see how it worked the opposite way than what he wanted. Um, turn to Colossians 2.18. Now, I know, you know, I know how Christians are in these angels, man. They, they, they talk more about, he sent his angel. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm not saying they don't minister. I'm just saying I don't know why you're, I don't know why you're going out of your way to give them any credit when you're supposed to worship God. He says there, let no man beguile you. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. You could lose your reward doing this. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Not realizing that, you know, 
probably the angels, you know, the winged beings you're talking about are devils. There's just, listen, there's no reason to exalt angels any more than what they are. Why would you? They're not God. They're not the Creator. And there's a bunch of them that'd like to probably kill you. If they could. So the best thing to do is, is don't get caught up in that. Don't worship angels. Don't, don't do anything. You know, I, you know, you say, well, I've got a bunch of these little old knickknacks, you know. Yeah, I, I'd take them outside. Boom! You know, and, uh, boom! I know. I'm just saying, man. You know, just... What's the, point of, what's the point of understanding it if you're not going to adjust your life to it? I, that's what I want to know. If it doesn't mean anything, then okay. But if it does mean something, then I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe I won't, maybe I won't be talking about angels, you know. And, and, and I, you said, but doesn't the Bible talk about guardian angels? No, it doesn't. It talks about angels representing things, representing children or kingdoms or kings. And that's what it talks about. And a lot of times, those angels that it's talking about, like the prince of Tyrus or the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece, is spiritual wickedness in high places. That's their representation. Talking about the kingdoms of this world. So keep that in mind. You know, and plus, you know, I talked about this, and I, I think I, I made an error by saying that Hollywood was in Cal or Los Angeles. I guess it's outside of there. But Los Angeles, the angels... Then Hollywood's where the stars are. And stars are angels in Revelation 1.20. Uh, Ashtaroth has a star right in the middle of the, of the, of the word. You've got to be careful of this stuff of um, uh, getting caught up in it. Especially this, you know, everybody wants to talk about angels. There's books about angels all over the place. Hmm. That verse warns you about that in a voluntary humility in worshiping of angels. It says you can lose your reward. Huh? Touched by an angel. I mean, there's, there's songs. I mean, you say, but that's, they, have such a, they have such a good storyline. Yeah, they do, based upon a lie. Angels can't save anybody. Huh? California, California angels? I mean, the most, one of the most wicked places on earth, and that's all they talk about, you know, the Los Angeles. <laughs> the angels and the stars. and It's the most God, one of the most godless places on the planet. So don't be too quick to... Um, here's, okay, we've we got time to do this one. This will this will finish it up for the day. Turn to Daniel 10.13. I added this one, and I thought, should I add this one? Uh, I'm not sure how major of a confrontation, but what it taught was maybe not heard this before but it says there in Daniel 10 13 I need to turn there because I've just got it written in um, give me a second here Daniel 10 13 <clears throat> now this is where Daniel spoke he's praying and he's asking God for some answers to some things and it says in verse 13 but the prince of the kingdom of Persia Remember I told you about principalities and representing kingdoms? Well, Persia's one of them. Prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me low, uh, withstood me one in 20 days. Who? Look at verse 4 to 6. And in the fourth and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the, of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphaz. His body was also like beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in the color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Who does that sound like? Huh? That is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. You find it also in Revelation chapter 1. The same description, a few different words, but I mean, it's, it's talking about this. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that is trying to come and answer, probably as the angel of the Lord, to answer uh, uh, Daniel. And he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, notice it calls them, these angels, princes, 
one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So he's saying, look, I've come to tell you, but you prayed, you, you prayed nearly three weeks ago, and I've been held up. Isn't this the second person in the Godhead that said he was held up by the, by the prince of Persia for 21 days? How in the world can that be? Then he says there, um, oh, no, I want you to turn to Zechariah 3.2. Do you know what Daniel's getting? Daniel's getting revelation about the last days and about the kingdom coming and about Daniel's uh, 70 weeks and all that. Now, obviously, Gabriel delivered that message, but he's getting information about the end. And the Lord's trying to get him that information, but he's held up 21 days by this prince. Then in Zechariah 3, 2, look at verse 1, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, you know that Jesus Christ appears as, it's called a theophany, an appearance of God. This is the angel of the Lord. This is Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord. And the Lord, because it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that have chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You see what's going on there? The second person in the Godhead is rebuking the devil in the name of the Father. In, in, he's rebuking the devil in the name of, of another part of the Godhead. Almost like he doesn't have the right to. I think, we, I think we underscore this, this, this fight that's going on. It's not about this who's got all the power. We know God has all the power. It's whether God has the right. Righteousness. He must be right all the time. And I can tell you there are certain portions in the Old Testament where the deck is stacked against him, man. The devil has a point. And the thing's not been resolved. So it looks like the second person in the Godhead rebukes him in the name of the Lord, the Father. He can't rebuke him by himself. The same way you'll find, look in Jude 9. Yet Michael the archangel, with contending with the devil, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not... Bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. At that time, Michael... You say, how much, power, how much power has he got? The devil's got a lot of power. At least he did then. He had a lot of power. You say, what? Because something wasn't resolved. And, you know, the devil, he's always hiding behind... He's always hiding behind your flaws and... <laughs> And, and not that God has flaws, but there was something that wasn't completed. Something that wasn't... Something the devil accused God of, and God couldn't answer it right then and there. Look at... Um, or at least the second person in the Trinity couldn't. And I'll show you where it's at. Turn to Job chapter 10. We've already covered it. I mean, who could withstand God for 21 days? But this fight was far from over with. You know, by the time you get to, to Malachi, the last verses of Malachi, it says it ends with a curse. By the time you get the last verse of Malachi, do you know that God doesn't even have a seed in which the king can come from? Because he cursed the seed back in Jeremiah, I think it's 44 or something like that, or 24. He cursed the line. That Christ was, that the Messiah was to come from. He said, no man of this man's seed will ever uh, where, uh, sit on the throne of Israel. And, and, I mean, he cursed the line. And the only way around that was a virgin birth. <laughs> but God's stacking the deck against himself as he goes through there. And this is just one of those things. Look at uh, Job 10, look at verse 4 to 6. Joe brings this up, and I, I, it wouldn't be surprising that the devil's not right there whispering in his ear. And he, this is Job talking to the Lord. Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as man seeth? 
Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as man's days? I mean, he said that thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searchest after my sin? Who are you? Who are you to judge me? You have no idea of what I go through being, going through this. You, you have, you've never experienced pain in your life. You've never had any of this ever happen to you. Right? You see how the argument kind of like, well, it's a good argument. Do you know when Jesus Christ actually rebukes the devil? He won't believe this. Turn to Luke chapter uh, 4 verse 8. You say when? When he's flesh and he's been tempted. He's fasted. Forty days and forty nights he's being tempted of the devil. Now the second person, the Godhead, tells him where to head in. 4 verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou, uh, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So he ends up rebuking him right there. He tells him, Get lost. But not till after he's flesh and not till after he's experienced some things. He now knows what it's like to see through man's eyes, to experience pain, to experience deprivation, to experience temptation. You see, this thing is, is more than just about might. It's about right. And God has to be right all the time. So this thing's like a progression. And, and as... I mean, like I said, man, you have no idea what Calvary did. Calvary destroyed the devil. It destroyed him because God became right in everything. So anyway, um, I had another verse down here. Ah, Isaiah 50, verse 9. <laughs> I probably should have read that one first. This is one of them verses that kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's where the, the, the Lord's calling in the devil. Uh, it says, Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, oh, no, that's not it. Let me see, am I in the right place? 50 verse 9, that's not, oh, verse 8. It's not verse 9. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. And you know what the, you know what the Lord did? He said, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He just bringing them in. Come on, let's mix it up. Isaiah 50, verse 8. Okay. Um, I think that's going to cover. There's probably more. I could probably scour through and find some more attacks and things that are going on. Um, but next week, I'm going to have comments on the deep. The, uh, Dr. Ruckman laid these out and... Um, and I'm kind of taking them and expanding them, and, and we probably got at least one more week, maybe two. We'll see. But um, this is going to get into that body of water that's out there and, and what it's about, the best I can tell you. So is there any questions about what we covered this morning?